Seven and the Old Goat, played blissfully, I think, by Ronald Pickup. God, he's heaven. Um, his story is much more complicated in, in the book. He has a comeuppance that is very, very different than what you see on screen. Um, and I don't think it would be um, 12A if, if they put that on. Um, so it's, so it is, it's a different creature, but because I've done quite a lot of it myself, I do know you do have to take to bits the book, really, and reassemble it as a screenplay. It's like turning a noun into a verb. It's like turning the interior world of a novel um, into the exterior, narrative-driven, conflict-driven world of a screenplay. And then, of course, what happens is the actors come on board and take it off in their own direction again. So the book is a long way in the past, um, and it can be a very magical process, particularly when you have a cast of your dreams. I mean, I can't imagine a more wonderful cast than this, although I think some of them are too young. I mean, Celia Imri and Bill Nye, I think he's 62, and I think she's 59, I'm far too young. But anyway, they obviously volunteered to do it. And the culture in India, as indeed in many cultures except Western Europe and America, honors old people and keeps them in the family and in the home and respects them and thinks that if you've got a few years on you, if you're what I would call very grown up indeed, rather than old, um, you've got a huge amount to offer. You're just like anyone else. You're just a bit older. You've had a bit more life under your belt. How interesting that is. And so I did think India was actually quite a good idea. And the weird thing is, of course, that it's happening. And the first um, gated communities are opening in India. And indeed, this film has prompted some articles. There was a very good one in The Independent which was track down people who are settling in, into places in the Philippines where they're building retirement complexes. Because, of course, travel is so scandalously cheap by air and so appallingly expensive by train that it's cheaper to fly to India than to go to Manchester, Manchester first class on the train. And your grandchildren, who often are scattered all over the globe anyway, would find it a sight more enticing to visit you in gorgeous, lovely India and have a holiday in Goa thrown in. <coughs> So it's not as mad as it sounds. But back to that germ of an idea, the extraordinary thing that sometimes happens with books, a magical thing, is that there I sitting at my desk a quarter of a mile away in South End Road, having this idea, and eight years later, hundreds and hundreds of people have flown across to India to shoot this film, and indeed we're here now. And the, the best bit was when I went out last November, a oh, year last November, to watch them shooting it for a couple of days in that hotel, which is a, a hotel right in the middle of the countryside. It's not in a town. They, they shot the town scenes in Jaipur later on, in Udaipur. It's in the middle of the countryside, landing, driving for an hour and a half in the middle of the countryside, seeing this sea of extras, which included Rajasthani tribesmen and hundreds of people's crews and catering wagons and this heavenly, heavenly cast, who all were sitting in their chairs with their Punkerwallers holding up brollies to keep the sun from them. And they all jumped up, well-bred thesps as they are, and came running along and embraced me and said, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for your lovely book. And that's music to a writer's ears, because it's quite true. And the sea change that's <coughs> happened in the film is just what happens when you make a film. But it was a heavenly moment. And the, can I go on? Because yes. you all want to go home for a bit, but um, I just want to tell you a moment about the hotel. The hotel, as I said, it's it's called the Raj Kamal. Raj, anyway, I've forgotten the name of it. Raj, anyway, it's in the middle of the countryside. It's a riding hotel, and um, it's got a stable full of horses, and it's ne it's it's next to a tiny village which is just a few few shacks, and so the art department built the bazaar next to the hotel with all the stalls and um, all these extras, as I said, and half, because the bazaar had to reflect a city bazaar, because they were going to then shoot the exteriors in the city, they imported a whole lot of, of young dudes from Mumbai who flew in, who do, you know, who are young models and, and kids and video chaps and God knows what, young filmmakers and, and ex, as extras. And they came with their motorbikes and their iPods and their dark glasses and stuff to reflect the, the, the mixed uh, amount of people you would find in an Indian city bazaar. So you've got the, the women suckling their children, swatting away the flies, and these gorgeous young, very sophisticated city kids on their motorbikes. So they're all flown into the middle of the countryside for these sort of six weeks 
of very magical shoot of shooting because you were so isolated. And of course, there are no planes flying over because there's hardly any planes, and so there's no disturbance. And they had a, an extraordinary time. They all came down with Delhi Belly at one point or another, but that's part of the experience. <laughs> Now, any questions? One or two, because I know suddenly lunch awaits. Shout them out and I'll repeat them. Yes. Um, I wonder if you thought, if you lost hope, that in Britain you could look after very grown up people a bit better. The question was, have we lost hope that we can look after them better? Well, I think that maybe the, the dialogue that comes from films like this, well, there are not many films like this, as we know, catering for, for this age group, I think that it's bringing you know, the subject back onto the, into the forefront. Also, because economically, it's very, very, the situation is so dire for young people trying to bring up kids. They need their grannies and their grandfathers around, because we're free. I've just become a grandmother. I'm free. I can look after these, these babies. So actually, it's, it, it works every way to, to, to keep people in the family. Of course, when we don't, this is a solution. But I think it's, 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 it's opening up a dialogue about how we treat old people, and there, there's a lot of discussion and heart-searching about it, because I think the way we treat them in this country is terrible. And it's not just this film, obviously, that's prompted that. It's been going on for a while. Yeah. What about one? Um, well, I used to live, I lived for two years in Pakistan, which of course isn't India, but um, next door. And so, and I'd written several novels based there and a couple of drama, television dramas there. So I was familiar with that, and I was familiar with India as a tourist. But Bangalore, the book is set in Bangalore, not Jaipur, because Bangalore is the call center, you know, as we know. Um, they put it in Jaipur because Jaipur is much more exotic and beautiful and all that. Um, but I hardly knew Bangalore, which I think is, in a funny way, an advantage. Because if you know somewhere too well, your story then has to fit into what you know. And I've been to Bangalore for one day, I think, years, 20 years ago. And, um, and I'd seen the techie, techie Silicon Valley side of it, but only passing through. But you can then make it, you can all, all, alter it for your plot. So Bangalore became my Bangalore, really. It wasn't quite like the real one. Um, but I was quite familiar with the subcontinent because of living there all, you know, a couple of years. It's one more, one more, one more, one more quick, quick. Deborah, yes. I have a question for you. Why were you prepared to give up the script writing aspect of this? Why was I prepared to give it up? Quite readily, it would appear. Sorry? Quite readily. Well, not as readily as I'm making out. <laughs> the question is giving up things. I mean, I found it quite difficult, to be perfectly frank. But it just happens. I mean, Tulip Fever, this book that I wrote before, that is a book that is made to be made into a film. You could just put the book into dialogue and you've got a film. That was bought by Stephen Spielberg. It had four scriptwriters. It had me, it had Lee Hall, it had Christopher Hampton, it had Tom Stoppard. It's got a fifth, Peter Chelson, who's written the best script of all. Um, that just happens with big films. And producers come on, new directors come on. They want to put their paw prints on it. Um, directors are always coming and going on a big, big project because they are, because so much can go wrong. And they all want to bring in their own either person to rewrite it or to change it in various ways. And then you've got a whole lot of producers who are changing it. It doesn't happen in television, but it happens in films a lot. So I'm sort of used to it, but it doesn't, it's not great. I would prefer to do it myself. And people say that you don't have the distance. I do, because I'm professionally, I do script writing. So I was a bit sad about that. But the book is different. And you just have a whole different experience reading the book. And I think the film does work. And it's got some good jokes, and it's got a big heart. But the book's very different. Debbie, thank you very thank much. You.
The only thing about failure is the failure to try. That's what we're all doing. So help us in trying, and we will be proud of what we're trying to Thanks for your